What we're talking about here, plain and simple, is an attempt by the largest corporations of the world who have little or no allegiance to a single nation to eliminate, it's their attempt to eliminate the last barriers that they have to face for the movement of their goods back and forth across borders. One of the problems we got into by the end of the Reagan period and, the, and through the Bush administration was that we suddenly found that here we were proclaiming the principles of free trade and acting as though we wanted to push the principles of free trade. And most of our trading partners thought we were crazy. This is, we think we have greater democratic control over our local communities, over, over our state and local governments, and we struggle for better democratic control over our national governments, but they're becoming increasingly irrelevant to the real economic decisions that shape the quality of our life. It's these global institutions that most will determine much that has to do with the quality of our life. If GATT goes through, corporations will have better opportunities than ever to move their production to that place where they can produce at the very lowest wages with the very smallest amount of environmental regulation and they will be guaranteed under the terms of GATT access to the markets in all the rest of the world. The second in our two-part series looking at GATT and NAFTA with Mike Conroy, economics professor, who tells us about this amazing revolution in international capitalism. Who's going to benefit and who's going to be hurt? Right now on Alternative Views. In our last Alternative Views program, we dwelt at length with NAFTA, and particularly covering all the aspects of it that were not covered by the regular media. We were talking with Mike Conroy, who's an economics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, director of the Latin American Economic Studies Program, and he's the associate chairman of the economics department. This time, we're going to talk about the big daddy of GATT. I saw a statement somewhere that said, if you, love, if you like NAFTA, you'll love GATT, because GATT, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, is something which is, can be even much more devastating uh, than uh, NAFTA. But before we have our interview, here are some news stories from the Alternative Press. Well, in one of the biggest fraud cases in history, it was announced by the New York Times on October the 21st that Prudential agrees to pay investors for fraud losses at least $371 million, that 400,000 individuals were affected by this court decision. It appeared that Prudential Securities, which is a unit of Prudential Insurance Company of America has been facing legal claims from people all over the country, investors, who said that the firm systematically cheated them in the sale of more than $800 billion of limited partnerships that invested in oil, gas, real estate, etc. Most of the investors were assured that these were safe conservative, secure investments. In many cases, they weren't. And they were told of tremendously lucrative returns that would accrue from this investment that didn't materialize. Well, the Security Exchange Commission ruled that the advertisements or the claims that Prudential Securities made to its customers were simply fraudulent. They simply lied systematically all over the country and thus forced them to pay back investors 
millions of dollars for these fraudulent uh, claims. They also charged the SEC widespread securities law violations at all nine prudential branch offices failing to live up to terms of a 1986 settlement with the SEC on fraud charges and severe legal and compliance problems with a whole lot of different issues. I think it should be pointed out that this is not a fly-by-night organization we're talking about. Prudential is one of the core Rockefeller establishment financial institutions and has been for years and years and years. It always kind of galls me to see some of these big corporate executives uh, saying, well, now all these bad things that you see about the capitalist corporations, those are just the smaller and medium-sized corporations. The big ones, we, uh, we are good corporate citizens. We wouldn't stoop to that. Well, we found out what happens with Prudential. And uh, you see, Prudential also had it. This chairman of the board, former chairman of the board, George Ball, who was one of the most significant men in the United States power structure and has been for years. You ever heard of Prucare? Well, that's Prudential Insurance. They're going to be one of the big recipients of the largesse of Clinton's health care program. And this, I guess, was only the was the second largest uh, uh, payout of because of fraud. The other one was uh, uh, Burnham Drexel Lambert. So you got to be careful whether it's a big company or a little company. They can't. You just can't say, "Well, we're an established old company." They'll uh, rip your drawers off just as fast as uh, some of the smaller companies. If Bill and Hillary Clinton are serious about slashing U.S. health care costs, expected to top $1 trillion by next year, they should re-examine Washington's love affair with the tobacco industry. Each year, smoking-related diseases are responsible for $21 billion in direct health care costs, according to the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Another $47 billion in unnecessary costs are due to lost productivity and lost earnings associated with smoking. Far from acting to curb these costs, let alone to slow, to slow a cigarette-related death toll of nearly 500,000 Americans per year, Congress has actively aided the tobacco industry. Capitol Hill has excluded cigarette fr cigarettes from the Consumer Product Safety Act and the Fair Labeling and Packaging Act. Lawmakers have also exempted, exempted tobacco from the Toxic Substances Act, even though a cigarette has more cyanide than was found in those tainted Chilean grapes that everyone was so worried about a few years back. I saw a, uh, an analysis of what was in cigarettes, and they, it was indicated that the cigarettes not only had benzene, but it also had DDT, and phosgene, and phosgene, as people probably know, is nerve gas. So that actually when you're taking a big old long puff of that uh, cancer stick, that uh, you're actually inhaling uh, this uh, uh, nerve gas and uh, carrying out chemical warfare against your own body. In the last few years, Congress has killed or simply ignored at least 10 anti-smoking legislative initiatives. The White House has been no better. Ronald Reagan and George Bush waged a costly war on drugs. This despite studies showing that illegal drugs were connected to the deaths of 19,096 Americans last year, 126th the number that were killed by cigarettes. And while the Reagan and Bush administrations were waging their war against drug pushers in Colombia, they were also actively pressuring other governments, especially in Asia, to open their market markets to U.S. tobacco products. The new issue of World Smoking and Health, a publication of the American Cancer Society, looks at why the White House and Capitol Hill continue to guarantee tobacco's special place as the only mass-marketed consumer product that causes widespread death and disease when used as intended. <laughs> the results are not surprising. The tobacco lobby has bought out our elected politicians, and the bribes are getting bigger. Industry contributions to incumbent U.S. Senators through 1991 and the first half of 1992 were up 192 percent over the contributions made during all of the 1987-88 campaign cycle, according to one article. Will Clinton change things? Don't hold your breath. 
Several top White House advisors, including Mickey Cantor, the president's former campaign manager and current U.S. trade uh, representative, have close ties to the tobacco industry. Uh, in these times, in an earlier edition, said that there were they pumped 25.7 million dollars into the campaigns of 1991 and 1992, and the largest amounts of this of this money went to the key members of the committees handling the health reform legislation. We'll have more news later. Let's turn now to our interview with Mike Conroy, economics professor at the University of Texas, about GATT. Now, Mike, uh, we've had GATT uh, since I remember people uh, talking about it uh, in, the, in the late 40s, early 50s. Why is there such a big uh, to-do about GATT now? Well, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, <coughs> which people think about as a treaty agreement, is in fact a whole organization. It's a world organization that focuses on tariff and trade. And it has had as its goal since the end of the Second World War, eliminating all barriers to the movement of goods across boundaries of countries, and it's come back into our focus since 1986 when the latest round of negotiations was begun. It happened to be started in Uruguay, and so it's been called the Uruguay Round of GATT. And what they're attempting to do is to further reduce tariffs below the levels that earlier negotiations had gotten them to and clarifying all kinds of new areas that previously weren't covered by GATT, including trade and services, intellectual property rights, uh, a whole variety of issues that previously weren't uh, taken into consideration. The new GATT agreement, which emerged from negotiations in Geneva, where it's headquartered, on December 15th, um, is not what people had hoped it would be in the end, because it isn't a complete agreement. It is still riddled with compromises and concessions and special interests. But if it's implemented, it will take us dramatically closer to a world in which not only are there few barriers between countries in terms of the flows of goods and services, but much less ability on the part of countries to control the movement of goods across their borders and therefore much less ability on the part of countries to organize their own economic development processes. But don't we have two things going here? We talk mostly about countries when we talk, I say we, the media and the government, <clears throat> when they talk about trade. But trade is carried on by corporations, multinational corporations, and I guess I've seen uh, the most of it is carried on by, I think, about 500 multinational corporations. And I've also seen figures that up to 50%, maybe even more than 50% of the trade is not trade from one country to the next, but it's intra company trade. It's a company trading with its subsidiaries, etc. So what are we really talking about here? What we're talking about here, plain and simple, is an attempt by the largest corporations of the world who have little or no allegiance to a single nation to eliminate, it's their attempt to eliminate the last barriers that they have to face for the movement of their goods back and forth across borders and the elimination of a wide range of regulatory policies, of industry subsidy policies, of protection policies, and I don't call them protectionist policies, but I call them protection policies because we have a legitimate right to some protection of our national interests. The elimination of those protection policies so that they have an absolutely clear and open playing field on which to operate. The trade, you're absolutely correct, is dominated by a small number of very large corporations and the vast majority of the world's trade doesn't pass through what we call free markets. It isn't that you go out and find out what the price is in eight or ten different international markets for a commodity, get the cheapest one and bring it across where it's recorded as it crosses the border at its real market value. The vast majority of trade takes place within 
corporations where one subsidiary of a company sends a product to another subsidiary of a company. And the prices that are charged for that transaction have nothing whatsoever to do with free market prices unless it's absolutely coincidental. <laughs> the prices which are charged in this process called transfer pricing, something which Congressman Jake Pickle just began to scratch at during his last year and a half in the Congress. Transfer pricing allows firms to put whatever price they want on the commodity that they move from one country to another. And by setting their prices, they can not only avoid taxes in the higher taxing con country, but they can have enormous impacts upon the terms of trade, upon the value of imports and the value of exports of the countries with whom they're working, avoiding virtually any governmental control over the movement of wealth within these corporations. That's why GATT is so important to the global elite of corporations, because it reduces dramatically the limited barriers that still exist to their total operation on a global scale without much control at any local level. Now, there's something else that's happening, too, and that is the division of the world by the big guys uh, into basically three areas, the economic, the European Union, uh, the Western Hemisphere, and the Asian Rim, uh, with Africa, I guess, uh, being tossed in there for whoever wants it. But uh, now, how does this fit into the GATT uh, type of structure? Well, I think the most important force within GATT is simpler than that. It's the group of seven. The seven largest industrial mm. democracies, they call themselves. <laughs> yeah. Seven largest industrial countries. The United States, mm -hmm. um, Great Britain, France, Italy, Canada, Japan, Germany. and Germany. Okay? Those seven countries effectively account for more than 60% of world trade, just the trade among themselves. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we saw taking place during the closing days of the negotiation of this last round of the GATT Treaty was tremendous outcries coming from other countries around the world saying, wait a second, you can't do that. That wasn't part of what we did in our negotiations. And they essentially said, wait a second, just forget it, guys. We're talking to one another. And the final round of the negotiations was between the French and the United States, <laughs> and the Germans, and the Japanese over what concessions they were willing to make because theirs were the most important markets in this process. And it really does separate them out from the rest of the world. So you really have the group of seven and the rest of the world. And this particular round of agreements is going to be most beneficial for the group of seven. But the vast majority of the other nations around the world are going to have to go along with it, otherwise they get excluded and get mm -hmm. isolated because they have to have access to the markets of the Group of Seven. Mm -hmm. And unless they abide by the GATT treaties, they're not going to get that access. Well, now, as I understand it, these Group of Seven countries still, if we're just talking about countries as traders, they still trade mainly among themselves. That's correct. Although there is some north-south trade. That's correct. But now, what are they, are they setting up these, the division of these three areas of the world to so that they can vertically, geographically, uh, exploit the um, uh, the raw material and all and the cheap labor in these uh, areas that they will dominate? Well, I'd, I tend to think that what we have are different stages in the movement towards a single goal that they have set out. The single goal that they've set out is to have no barriers whatsoever inhibiting their ability to go into uh, Erie and Java and take the minerals out of area in Java, utilizing very low wage, and ship them to anywhere in the group of seven, or to go into a newly independent, newly democratized South Africa, and to exploit that particular market, selling their products as well as bringing the minerals and other resources out. They want access to those markets, but those aren't the really dominant markets. It's the trade among these countries, you're mm -hmm. correct in saying. But as steps towards GATT, and to some extent as goads to the creation of GATT, and as fallbacks in case GATT didn't go through, you had the creation of the European community, now the creation of the North American Free Trade Agreement and its possible extension to other countries in the Western Hemisphere, right. and the creation of a Pacific Rim trading group where Japan is negotiating special trading relationships with Thailand, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, in its sphere of dominance, but it's really a much more complicated uh, world than one which would be broken into those three 
those three groups. If there hadn't been agreement reached on GATT, the Europeans were perfectly comfortable emphasizing over the course of the next 10 to 15 years the further integration of the European community and its protection from the rest of the world. Had it not gone through, NAFTA would have become the basis for the expansion of U.S. markets and U.S. access to Latin America, and Japan would have further established special trading relationships. But all of these individual trading relationships now will be superseded by GATT, because GATT's rules are even more general. GATT's rules are even more profound. GATT's rules are common across all of these regions, and in theory at least, GATT will break down some of the protectionism that still remains between NAFTA and the European community, or between NAFTA and Japan. Isn't this also going to solidify or put in concrete the uh, existing uh, economic uh, development and trade relationships uh, because the United States, or Germany, grew behind protectionary walls. The United States uh, industrialized behind high tariffs, and so did Korea and Japan and Taiwan. So this means that the international uh, power structure is going to make sure that there are going to be no more of these upstarts that could uh, maybe challenge their uh, hegemony? Well, that's a, that's a very insightful comment, Frank, and one that we haven't seen too much in the press. What GET does, among other things, is it eliminates many of the developmental tools that countries have successfully used in the past to go from raw material exporters to industrial giants. The best example of that, I think, is Brazil. Brazil has a tremendous amount of schizophrenia around its participation in GATT because Brazil is a very large country with mineral wealth and industrial wealth and its own technology and so forth. It's also taken advantage of a deliberate process of violating patent laws, <laughs> of pirating software, of copying computers. It's been an outcast, but it may well have been the best strategy for Brazil not to sign copyright laws, not to, to sign new agreements on the protection of intellectual property rights worldwide, because then it has to start paying licensing fees for things that it gets from other parts of the world, which right now it can simply mm -hmm. copy. Used to be we would claim that it's just those communist countries over there that are copying <laughs> our technology and not paying, paying for the patents. Well, in fact, it turns out that the biggest copiers of software, the biggest imitators of computer chips, the biggest uh, non-legal uh, or illegal copying comes out of places like Taiwan, Mexico, and Brazil. And one of the things they're going to have to give up as a process under this GATT agreement is their ability to do that with some impunity. They're going to have to eliminate the subsidies that they give to the development of specific industries. Here's a concrete example. What's the model which is being used now as the example that the poor countries of Latin America and Africa should pursue as a basis for developing a high standard of living? It's the Asian model. It's the mini dragon model of Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And the theory is that that's a free market model. But as soon yeah. as you start looking at what those countries did in the 1960s and 1970s in order to go from being relatively primitive countries to very advanced industrial countries, you find it wasn't the free market model. It was rather a very deliberate set of government programs in coordination with the largest industries, creating local monopolies, protecting them from international competition, demanding that they export their products, demanding that they become internationally competitive, and conditioning the continuation of government support on the evidence that these industries were internationally competitive. That's not the free market model. No. That's a very deliberate developmental model those programs would not be allowed under GATT. So like you say, it's the countries that have already achieved significant levels of industrialization saying, okay guys, nobody else should copy the policies which we utilized in order to develop to this level. And as a matter of fact, what you should do is open all your borders to the products which we can now export and simply ship us your raw materials, ship us your labor, allow us to invest for little assembly plants in your countries when we need cheap labor to ship back into the global markets. And it is, in a sense, an attempt on the part of the already powerful nations to eliminate the future ability of Brazil or of Mexico or of Colombia or of Indonesia 
to implement policies which would make them serious industrial threats in the near future. This will also entrench uh, some of the worst dictatorships and also prevent any um, indigenous or popular uprisings, too, to take place, I would think. Well, I'm not certain that I see the, the direct link between GATT and the dictatorships, other than the fact that international or transnational capital doesn't like the uncertainty of democracy. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to impose austerity on a country under democratic conditions. The terrible turmoils of Russia and the other republics of the former Soviet Union where they're trying to transform their economy and their political system at the same time is one illustration of that. A better illustration is the fact that Chile's economy performed much better from the point of view of the international bankers when General Pinochet was in charge, when he could impose austerity, clamp down on inflation and eliminate labor unions and Chile's economy boomed during that period because of the political control. The countries like Korea with its political control, Singapore with its political control, anti-democratic controls, Taiwan, which is not a very democratic place, have used political controls as a basis for their rapid economic development. And if the giant corporations that are now reinforced through GATT gain more political power, then you're right, that probably is anti-democratic. The theory, of course, and this is all based on theory of free trade and the link between free trade and democratization. The theory says free trade will help to bolster the uh, uh, more economic growth, and more economic growth means more democracy and so forth. But if we look for cases indicating much of the concrete dimensions of that theory, they're hard to find. Now, you mentioned free trade. Now, this uh, goes back in theory to uh, the great economist David Ricardo uh, centuries ago. And uh, you hear all the time, oh, are you a free trader or a protectionist? It's almost like a McCarthyism that uh, you, if you're not for free trade, you're just a bad, bad person. Uh, what does free trade actually mean nowadays? Back in Ricardo's era, it meant that one country would do what it could do best, another country would do what it could do best, and then they would trade and everybody would benefit. David Ricardo talked in terms of a principle of comparative advantage. And that principle of comparative advantage is the tool that we use for teaching our undergraduate economic students the <laughs> meaning and the advantages of free trade. But as the New York Times was forced to admit on a, in a front page story last December, right about the time the GATT Treaty was, was to be signed, that here's a primer on free trade. And it got into the third paragraph of its primer on free trade and it said, but you've got to admit that no economist can give us concrete examples of the notion that free trade will necessarily raise the standard of living of all of those who participate in it. We do know that free trade raises the standard of living of those who are more powerful, more advanced, more developed in a free trading relationship. What's more difficult to demonstrate is that it significantly improves the lot of those who are less powerful, who are smaller, who don't have the same e economic clout or political clout in the global economic system. Truth of the matter is, there is no country in the world that practices free trade. Second truth that I think we have to recognize is that the Reagan and Bush administrations claimed that their target was for us to be the leading nation in terms of free trade. One of the problems we got into by the end of the Reagan period and, the, and through the Bush administration was that we suddenly found that here we were proclaiming the principles of free trade and acting as though we wanted to push the principles of free trade and most of our trading partners thought we were crazy. <laughs> the Japanese aren't free traders, <laughs> the Germans aren't free traders, the British aren't, Margaret Thatcher might have been, but British government policy was not, the French are not free traders, the Canadians may be closer, or at least they were closer under Mulroney, but then Mul Mulroney's whole party disappeared after he signed the North American Free Trade Agreement in, on behalf of Canada. All of our trading partners practice one level or another of protection, and it's very sophisticated protection. It's not just tariff barriers, it's a wide array of non-tariff barriers. The Japan bashing that takes place in this country ought to be recognized as statements that say Japan is not a free trader. The world markets in which we function are not free markets. 
So the argument from the very large corporations is GATT will move us towards more free markets and force us all to be more free marketeers and allow us to have more efficient trading relations. And you get these numbers of hundreds of billions of dollars in increased welfare that comes essentially from having access to somewhat cheaper products from some place that we weren't getting them before. But there's a problem. The problem is it isn't whether you protect or not. Everyone protects. There are certain things that we simply don't allow to go across our borders. Anyone who suggests that there are systematic reasons for protecting, anyone who suggests that we ought to protect in order to allow certain industries to develop, David Ricardo's old infant industry argument, is now called protectionist and therefore wrong. But if you push these anti-protectionist folks to the wall, they're going to say, yes, 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 we always have to have some basis for protecting. And what we're really doing now is negotiating the conditions under which other countries are going to have access to our markets. But at the same time, the corporations that are backing this are also, are also negotiating the conditions under which they're going to have access to the cheaper labor in other markets in which they'd like to produce. To me, one of the scariest things about uh, GATT is the World Trade Organization. Is that the name of it? That that's the group to... that's supposed to be created. Yeah, and those are the people who in secret will be determining whether there are any violations of uh, GATT and then the penal then they will assess the penalties uh, that will be the teeth in GATT. Well, there, GATT has always had an enforcement organization. And under that enforcement organization, one country after another has gone forward and said that particular policy in that particular country represents illegal subsidies. Therefore, we are allowed to pose an imp a punitive tariff on the goods coming from that country. The U.S. has done it more frequently under the Clinton administration than it did under Reagan and Bush in order to protect industries that seem to be attacked by government subsidies elsewhere or by other violations of the earlier uh, varieties of the GATT agreement. And one very vivid example of the problems this can create for us comes in terms of the institutions that GATT has for protecting people against pesticide and chemical residues on food that goes back and forth across the borders of one country or another. GATT will not allow you to impose a control on the movement of food products into your country that is other than the common standard worldwide control that's allowed. Jim Hightower here in Texas has been one of the most outspoken opponents of that because as he points out in places like banana products coming across from Central America, from Africa, from Asia into the United States, the code which is the common code in terms of the amount of DDT which will be allowed on bananas allows 50 times more DDT than we presently allow coming into the United States. The U.S. will have to change its laws to allow that global standard of DDT on bananas at the startup of GATT and will then have to lobby with an organization that is called, and if it sounds arcane, it really is, it's called the Codex Alimentarius. Oh, yes, yeah. The Codex yeah. Alimentarius from the Latin for food-related code it's based in Rome, and they set the global standards. So if you and I, as individuals who want to organize a grassroots movement to change the levels of pesticides which are allowed on products coming into this country, now have to go to Congress in order to get that changed. We also, under GATT, would have to go one step further. If we can convince the U.S. Congress to direct the U.S. government, then we have to go over and convince this whole body of representatives from around the world under the Codex Alimentarius, including all of the representatives of the banana-producing countries who are going to say, well, wait a second, if we don't use DDT, it's going to be more expensive. We can't make that transformation that rapidly, and they will oppose any increase. So what we have at great cost done in this country in terms of raising our environmental standards relative to many of the world's standards are going to get beaten down in terms of the quality of products that cross the borders. Um, and we aren't going to be able to do anything about it other than through these cumbersome organizations. Which are non-elected. We have no way of... Uh, they're absolutely not... Uh, no, the, Codex Element, the Codex Alimentarius is appointed by GATT Mm -hmm. which consists of a council of representatives appointed by the governments that are participants in GATT, and we have very, very little control over that. Mm -hmm.
What kind of uh, enforcement powers does GATT have? In theory, GATT has tremendous World enforcement Trade powers. The World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization, using GATT as a basis, in theory has tremendous uh, powers. It can um, authorize punitive tariffs or punitive quotas or the blocking of trade from any member country if it decides that member country is, is um, violating the agreement. So if, for example, you're a Honduras and you're trying, as a tiny, tiny country in Central America, trying to stimulate the development of a little textile industry, and you come up with a creative program for giving low interest loans and other support to some cooperatives or small business people trying to set up that textile industry. Korea, a gigantic textile country, or Japan, or India can go to the GATT and say, that's a violation because that's an inappropriate subsidy. We don't care whether they call it a development program or not. We're going to block Honduran exports of those textile. We're going to call for blocking Honduran exports of the, to all the members of GATT. And so the authority is ultimately the ability of GATT to block the exports of a country that is in disfavor at that particular moment for its policies to any other member. I understand too, maybe it's only with NAFTA, but uh, is it GATT also that they can actually levy fines on the treasury of uh, participating countries that... Uh... Well, in theory, but it never gets to that stage. I and see. it probably would never get to that stage. Long before they'd be able to levy fines, you'd have countries ripping up their GATT participation agreements and going off on their own. Which would be difficult because the whole world would be operating uh, under GATT exactly and they would right. be outside of this wall. That's exactly right. Mm. And so the dynamic tension there is between GATT's, the heavy-handed with which GATT implements its regulations at the same time it doesn't want to see countries pull out. But it's the smallest countries, the ones that most desperately need a little bit of freedom to exercise some progressive developmental policies that are going to be most isolated and have the smallest amount of cloud and the smallest amount of power like, in this whole uh, process. Like Thailand being forced to import cigarettes when right. they tried to protect their countries, their people's health. Or the, even the big ones, the big countries, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I, th uh, I forget which country it is that's uh, protested the United States' the requirement of a special net so that they don't trap tuna, uh, not tuna, uh, dolphins in the, in the fishing nets. Uh, I think Japan is uh, challenging the United States' prohibition of exporting just raw uh, timber. Um, and even some corpora U.S. corporations, I understand, are going to challenge the uh, health system of Canada, saying that it's unfair, unfair trade because their corporations in Canada don't have to pay the medical uh, benefits that the uh, U.S. corporations have to there, pay. There are other this even go on and on. There were even more outrageous decisions that have been made uh, in Belgium, for example. Uh, the Belgian Parliament passed a law saying that if you're going to sell beverages you have to have a recycling program in place for the beverage containers. If they're glass beverages, they're glass bottles, they have to be recycled. If they're aluminum, they have to be recycled. And that you have to have a proactive program. It isn't just that you allow them to be recycled, you have to have a program in place. The other countries that were shipping beer and soda to Belgium sued in the International Court of Justice at The Hague under the terms of the GATT against Belgium saying that was an unfair restraint on trade for importing beverages from outside and they were upheld and Belgium was forced to rescind that law and to accept the more general recycling provisions that are accepted under the terms of GATT. Um, that's another example of the extent to which while trying to pursue what the supporters of GATT are going to call a level playing field for trade among countries, you are giving up a tremendous amount of your own ability to control what happens at your borders and within your borders, a tremendous amount of what you're able to do in order to help your own development along. The environmental area is an area that's very important to GATT because environmentalists were almost completely excluded from the negotiation of GATT. GATT, like NAFTA, involved a very elite, secretive group of people meeting at various points around the world, negotiating, cutting deals, industry-specific deals with representatives from the various trade ministries and commerce ministries of governments that were participants in it. There were virtually no representatives of environmental ministries or of the environmental movement.
and GATT is probably going to undermine the single most important push forward for the environmental movement in terms of, uh, of world trade, which is the push to try to take protectionism in terms of products crossing the border to levels of protection with respect to processes. Let me explain very briefly. Right now, you can stop the importation of a banana coming across the border if you find pesticide or chemical residues on it beyond U.S. standards. After GATT is signed, it'll be only stoppable if it exceeds the Codex Alimentarius standards, which are often much higher than U.S. standards. What uh, higher in the sense that they would permit more of these they pesticides would permit, and all, yeah. permit more of the pesticides to come in, mm -hmm. a higher quantity of parts mm -hmm. per billion allowed on the, fr on, the, on the fruit or on the vegetable. What environmentalists have pushed for is not product requirements because you can grow broccoli with illegal chemicals and then wash the hell out of that broccoli and get most of those chemicals off and the inspection system is so bad that a lot of it will go through in any event they want process requirements if you the environmental community worldwide wants us to change trade laws so that if you use an illegal environmentally damaging process in Mexico, in Thailand, in Colorado, in outside of Moscow, wherever it might be, if you use a process which is found to be environmentally damaging, that product sh you should be able to ban because it is hurting the global environment in the process of making something cheaper as it goes across the border. This would mean global inspection of environmental processes at the plant level, which in fact is a very important goal of the environmental movement. GATT as it stands right now would eliminate any possibility of process restrictions on the conditions that you could legally use for barring the importation of goods into the United States or any other GATT member. You know, Mike, what I see in all of this is a, well, I started to say subtle. I guess maybe it's not quite so subtle. At least it isn't quite so abrupt, but it's really an international revolution of of people from the international power structure, which is basically economic in nature, taking the ability of uh, people to uh, have any democratic control, whether state, local, or national level, and taking it all and putting in international bodies. We have had the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, but now all of these things like uh, uh, NAFTA and then with GATT, all of these decisions will supersede anything at the uh, democratic uh, level in any country. And then you also see efforts by these same people to beef up the United Nations, give the United Nations taxing authority, give the United Nations its own army. Uh, of course, the U UN is a very undemocratic organization too. So it looks like slowly all of these democratic gains, uh, not just in political, but environmental and health and everything that we've had, we fought for for centuries. It's all being taken away from us, and people don't even realize it. And I think what's even more dangerous, I think you're, you're fundamentally right, what's even more dangerous is we think we have greater democratic control over our local communities, over, over our state and local governments, and we struggle for better democratic control over our national governments, but they're becoming increasingly irrelevant to the real economic decisions that shape the quality of our life. It's these global institutions that most will determine much that has to do with the quality of our life. If GATT goes through, corporations will have better opportunities than ever to move their production to that place where they can produce at the very lowest wages with the very smallest amount of environmental regulation and they will be guaranteed under the terms of GATT access to the markets in all the rest of the world. It is something which threatens much of which we have been, what we have been able to pull together as a social contract in this nation with respect to environmental controls, minimum wages, protection of workers, keeping children out of factories, um, the conditions under which people are able to work on, in dangerous occupations. All of this is being undermined, not by a choice that we're making, but by our national acceptance of a set of international standards that are dramatically lower than our own and against which we will not be able to protect ourselves any longer because as soon as we try to say, gee, we don't like the environmental conditions in that Thai factory where they're producing those goods which are being shipped into the United States with very, very limited exceptions, prison labor, child labor, and a couple of other very minor exceptions, um, slave labor, um, we're not going to be able to block them. 
We're not going to be able to bar them. And we're going to be left with this illusion that now we have access to cheaper goods, but we will have access to cheaper goods, and the people who are producing them are going to be suffering the consequences of our having allowed this global system to be created over which we have less control than we ever have and against we ha which we have far less recourse than we have right now with respect to most of the processes that affect our lives. The insurrection by the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico has underscored the dangers of NAFTA. A 1979 Alternative Views interview with authors Dick Rivas and Philip Russell showed that the uprisings were occurring at that time as well. We'll show you a portion of that interview, although our equipment was a bit primitive at that time. Philip speaks first. There's a tremendous potential for violence in rural Mexico. There has been relatively little change simply because people are unorganized and the Mexican government is extremely effective at first co-opting protest or secondly suppressing it. This is just one example where the town rebelled against the mayor. Mayors, as are all political officials in Mexico, are appointed and then uh, the vote is carried out by the people who uh, vote for the appointed candidate. And in this particular little town in the state of Tlaxcala, the people rebelled and drove out their mayor. And yet they were completely unorganized, they were unarmed. And so if, these, if this type of protest ever continues, the Mexican government simply sends in the army and that's the end of it. Rural protest quite often spills in to urban areas. And here you can see one example of peasants who come into Mexico protesting the many grievances. Uh, they have lack of land, they're poor, uh, they don't have jobs, they've been lied to by the government literally for generations. Dick, could you tell us how you uh, made contact with these revolutionary guerrillas in uh, Mexico? There's, um, there has been now for at least since about 1970. Since about 1970, the left-wing movement in Mexico has been growing. It was practically closeted before that. And it has developed an armed wing. Uh, there are terrorists of 16 different stripes in Mexico. And there are a few organizations which I regard as more literate, which organize peasants to seize land and arm them. Uh, one of these organizations, which is now called the PPM, the Proletarian Party of Mexico, had a representative and a member and a founder in San Antonio, Mario Cantu, a restaurant owner there, who knew the people who formed the PPM before they had formed it. When they formed it, he joined. Mario was frequently implicated in gun running affairs. And I went to him and said, look, I want to do a story about uh, you and the guerrillas. It took about six months to win their confidence. He had to go to Mexico twice. And he was on federal probation at the time and wasn't supposed to leave San Antonio. He you went to federal probation? Oh, yes, he was. Uh, and, uh, for gun running? Or? No, this time for uh, a charge known as shielding illegal aliens. Mm -hmm. He had <laughs> interfered with an immigration raid. <clears throat> but he went to Mexico and met with the guerrillas. The, their leaders are all in hiding and are wanted and set up for me to go down. Then I went down, and there were some snafus. But the first time, I spent a while with them in August of 77. Mario and I went together in January of 78 and in October of 78. What were some of your experiences there? Well, my general impression is this, that, that in rural Mexico, uh, democracy has never existed. What you have there is a rule by force, the big landlords. Uh, shoot anybody who gives them trouble. And the small peasants, if they lose their land or want more land, resort to arms to get it. Because the government is, practically speaking, absent. Uh, they petition for land. I've talked to people who are waiting 35 years for a land grant. So you've got a, an armed Wild West type society in some sections of those hills. Where the, the peasants are actually seizing land with guns forcibly. Yes. Is that, where yes. are the, some of the regions where this has taken place? Well, in, in the Sierra Juarez of Oaxaca mm -hmm. and in Veracruz, there's been quite a bit of Michoacan. There's been some by other organizations practically anywhere in rural Mexico. Mm -hmm. from what was going on in the Sonora region, more in the north? There were some articles in Mother Jones mm 
about uh, a movement of peasants there to expropriate land from absentee landlords. This was at the end of the Echevarria term. Mm -hmm. And it's never been clear in my mind, Philip may know better than I do, whether or not, in fact, the PRI may have supported that. Mm -hmm. But that region is one in which there's a great deal of truck farming. Uh, they farm export crops and export them to the United States. Oddly enough, Mexico's importing beans. Oh my God. And, and wheat and most other staples. But uh, the peasants seized the land. And they declared that it was illegally owned because the tracks were too big, or bigger than what's allowed. This is a photo, incidentally, it's been stuck here, of a meeting of, this rev of a revolutionary party in a peasant village in Mexico. As you can see in the photo, almost all the adult males turn up. Here's another one of a similar meeting. Here is a peasant village of some 500 inhabitants. And this is a part of their armed force. It's been armed by a revolutionary group. Uh, if you will note, they're using uh, M1 carbines and uh, old Mausers. Here's another one in a smaller village essentially the same weapons. What chance do these people have against uh, the army? The army, in the most of these areas, the army is stationed in a, in, a, in a city. It takes days to get out there. The problem I think they have in fighting the army is that a resolve. I think they could probably outgun the army because they and have guerrilla, certain advantages guerrilla type and of certain tactics, but the problem is resolve. Um, the people very often seize land with guns and they'll fight off the landlord's thugs. But when the army and the agrarian reform comes in, they say, well, gee, now they've got us. In the long run, they may be right. Uh, it may make best sense to surrender, but the pattern thus far has been one of conflict with the landlord's agents and then running from the army, in fact, surrendering land to the army once you've taken it. Quite frankly, on my first trip, I was scared to death. I expected I was going to run into some hot-headed students who were up there agitating the peasants and pulling all sorts of dangerous stunts. It turned out not to be true. The people in these pictures are peasants. One of these fellows has an old Remington. It's a Mexican Revolution vintage rifle. Here's another meeting of uh, revolutionary peasants. How widespread is this around the country, and what is the support from the general public? Well, it's very hard for me to say how widespread it is because I've only seen the states of Oaxaca and Veracruz. Anytime you read Mexican newspapers, you will read of peasants seizing land and being lynched or shot anywhere in Mexico. It happens every week. It's, public support is never sought. The peasants do this as their own affair. I've never heard of never heard of them seeking support. But in rural Mexico, I would say it's pretty frequent now. Pretty frequent. What about in urban Mexico? Is, is there any uh, radical agitation there and activity going on? Since 1970, there's been so much of it. Um, the Mexican Workers' Party, the Mexican Communist Party are all much bigger and much more open. Uh, there are hundreds of independent groups. Uh, there are church groups that lean to the left. And they're your terrorists. There are groups in Mexico which make it, which are on a par with the Red Brigades in Italy. We hear less about them because the media in this country has a northeastern and European bias. Europe, the Red Brigades are much closer to New York than La Liga 23 de Septiembre. Uh, but they're still there. And every day in Mexico there's a bombing or an attempted assassination, I suppose, practically every day. Here's some death penalty facts from Amnesty International. Did you know that the USA is the only NATO nation to execute its citizens? But no credible study has shown the death penalty to be a deterrent in killings. In Texas, blacks convicted of killing white, a black convicted of killing whites is six times more likely to receive the death penalty than a white that commits the same crime. Only five other countries besides the US execute juvenile offenders. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Barbados, Iran, and Iraq. Between 1900 and 1985, it was found that 350 people were wrongly convicted and sentenced to the death penalty. Of these, 23 were executed.
1982 New York study found that the first stage of appeals cost taxpayers $1.8 million, which I'm sure has risen considerably since then. A 1988 Florida study concluded taxpayers pay $3.1 million per execution. A new book recently came out by Robert Perry, who's a top investigative reporter on the October Surprise. And in a review of it in The Nation, Christopher Hitchens reminds us of an interesting historical parallel to this story. He reports that Clark, Clark Clifford, in his 1991 memoir, Counsel to the President, reported about how the Republicans, Richard Nixon and his gang, subverted the Democrats' attempt to negotiate a peace settlement with the Vietnamese in 1968. Humphrey and Johnson were trying to negotiate a peace settlement that presumably would have gotten Humphrey reelected, and the Nixon team entered into secret negotiations with the Vietnamese to undermine this, according to Clark Clifford, who was Secretary of Defense then and had access to all the intelligence information. Senator John Tower of Texas, John Mitchell of the Nixon team, who later became his justice minister, which is something of a joke, negotiated with the Vietnamese and they broke off the negotiations with the Johnson team two days before the election. Well, according to Hitchens, this exact same process happened with the October surprise. One of the arguments against this story that the Reagan team would have negotiated in 1980 with the Iranians was that it was treason, that it was just simply unthinkable that no American would do this. But says Hitchens, if this had happened before, if the Nixon team had negotiated a secret deal with the Vietnamese to steal the election from the Democrats, then it makes perfect sense that a desperate Republican group, of which several of those people were in the Nixon team earlier, might do the same thing. People like Richard Allen, William Casey, etc., were part of the Nixon team then, and they were allegedly involved in the October surprise. One of the interesting thing about Robert Perry's book is that he refutes the claim that it was impossible for George Bush to have been in Paris during October to negotiate the final deal with the Iranians to hold hostage the Americans that were in the embassy there in 1980. According to the book by Perry, the claims that Bush had a good excuse and that Secret Service reports that had tracked him indicated that he was indeed in the U.S. It was bogus. The Secret Service reports show nothing of the kind and none of Bush's excuses hold up. And new sources were revealed that indicate that Bush was seen on Paris during this day. So this is an interesting rekindling of the October surprise controversy that just won't go away as more investigative reporters look into this story. And that's Alternative Views for this time. We would like to thank our crew who helped with the taping of the program and also provided editing assistance. Trish Busa, Itza Gutierrez, Shannon Lorito, and Manon Thomason. Additionally, Brian Lynch was our director, and Eric Eubank and Kevin West provided the crew for our new sections. Goodbye.